we've spoken so much in the past about the notion that commodity markets are volatile. Is this a regime now of higher prices? I hate to use the word because we've used it in the past. Is this a super cycle? Hey, for, we've been forecasting a super cycle now since October of 2020. So, you know, more than 18 months into this. So this is not something new. We've been in it for a while. But I think the investors need to wrap their head around that we're only beginning here. This is not the end of it. And, you know, we look at investor participation, open interest in commodity markets collapsing, um, investor outflow. We have specs um, position declining. That's in commodities. Equities, energy equities, free cash flow yields tell you they're severely undervalued. In some cases, high as 30%. Bond yields in the energy space widening right now. So the bond, you know, the, 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 the debt credit spreads, every single measure you look at tells you the investors are going. But as you just pointed out, this is just beginning at this point. And the only way you're solving this problem on a longer term basis, you need to get capital in the space, make investments, be able to grow supply. We can't do this at this point right now due to impediments, whether if it's ESG or people just afraid of the higher prices. The answer to your questions, this thing is just getting started. So, 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 Jeff, if this is just the early stages, if we are in the early innings of this so-called commodity super cycle, when exactly do we start to see enough pressure being brought on the market, enough pressure being brought on the overall companies in there that they will have to deploy capital, not just back to shareholders, but to drill for oil and gas? Or is that the whole world just in, in its move to clean energy, maybe making these companies a little bit more apprehensive about that kind of, you know, drill baby drill mentality? It, it, it has to start with the investors opening up the purse springs, making it very clear to these companies they need to invest. They need to have access to the capital. I like to say it's not about the supply and demand of the barrels of oil. It's about the supply and demand of the dollars used to create those barrels of oil. And right now we have significant impediments. But let's say, let's don't just all blame it on ESG. Let's not forget that two years ago or 23 months ago, oil prices were negative and the losses in this sector were nothing short than epic. And that's still in people's memory. So we need to see a good track record. To answer that question about when do the purse strings open up, let's go back to the previous super cycle. Prices moved up substantially in 03 and on to 04. It wasn't until 06 that the purse strings opened up substantially. And it began in late 05 with the equities moving. So, you know, it, it, when you look at these histories of these super cycles, it takes a while for investors to come into this space. They want to see a track record. They want to know that the coast is clear. So, you know, we're in the process of creating that track record with good returns, um, but we have yet to see the follow through. We're, we're, you know, Jeff, when you look at the, the, the overall coverage universe that you have, I mean, commodities can be any number of things. We've been focusing so much on the hard commodities, the things that we mine for, the things that we drill for, like oil, like nickel, like the, the other base metals. And there's the soft commodity side of things. We, we've seen a little bit more stability there. So as you look from a trading perspective, where do you see more upside in the coming months? Is it going to be in some of those agricultural commodities? Or do you think it's the hards that are going to be driving a lot of that upside potential for commodities overall? Actually, there's so much focus on oil and gas and an energy supply disruption in comparisons of the current situation in Russia with like the oil supply shocks of the 70s. What people are failing to recognize is what's going on on the non-energy side. Not only the hard commodities, as you mentioned, like nickel and aluminum and so forth, but it's the soft commodities. This disruption in the non-energy commodities is the largest we have ever seen. In the case of wheat, it's roughly 25% of global exports. In the metals, it's somewhere around 15%. Just to put this in perspective, the oil supply shock is maybe 1.5% of global supplies. Let me repeat that. In wheat, it's 25% of global exports. This is very large. I'm in the Middle East right now, and I can tell you places like North Africa are big importers of wheat, um, and this is going to put a lot of stress on the system. Let me also remind you, the last time we had food prices at these levels, um, we ended up with, you know, it helped kick off the Arab Spring, which culminated in other disruptions in energy. So this is a very serious issue. People need to be focused on it. The upside in both all the non-energies, I think, is substantial at this point, particularly aluminum, copper. Um, these markets are under it. So, you know, you ask me which one is likely to be the tightest. 
You know, I put um, wheat and corn right up there. Um, you know, the upside and, you know, corn, you know, it, it, you could potentially be spiking up to, you know, $10 a bushel type level. So, you know, the risk here and in, in the, the agriculture commodities, I think, is very significant. So, so Jeff, I, I mean, th there's no doubt your view here is that there is there is possibly more extreme upside for some of these given the supply demand dynamic. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you if there was a base case scenario that you're referring to, but then a bear case scenario where you see a lot of these things reversing course. What would have to happen for that thesis of yours right now to come under pressure and we see those commodity prices actually fall? The biggest risk here is that the supply shortages do so much da da damage to demand. Remember, demand destruction is not prices going high and killing off demand. If you think about it this way, it's supply coming out of the market. The demand tied to that supply has to be reduced, and the prices rise to the point of the last consumer still standing. That's what demand destruction is. But if you pull out all that supply and you create a recession, that could get you your pullback. But I want to emphasize, in the 1970s super cycle, we saw three recessions, one in 1970, another one in 74, and another one in 79, 80. But what happened to prices? It just went like this. It went like that. You keep going up. What happened to the super cycle in 2008 and 2009? Um, you had a big cyclical pullback, but prices rebounds right back up. So the, the biggest risk to the view near term, or I, I, by the way, I'm not going to say we put a high probability on it. You know, our view is no recession, but it would be that kind of damage done to demand due to supply disruptions creating a pullback in prices. But that is, you know, we aren't seeing any evidence. We're far away from demand destruction levels. You know, at this point, the risks are still to the upside. But that would be the type of risk that creates a pullback, but it'd be likely temporary as it was in the super cycle in the 70s and the super cycle in the 2000s. And um, we do not put a high probability on it right now.